my. It's perfect. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to season two of The Shade Chamber, your favorite not lore, not meta, not news Genshin podcast. I'm the dev who ported Doom to the Akasha system, Beefy. I'm the guy in the center of the withering zone you can't quite get to, Break. I'm the fan of Weapon Masters and pre parnum Disasters, Jer. I'm Mr. Steal Your Kaching, Rod. And I'm those third-party site cookies that you didn't disable in the Akasha system, Wander. If this is your first time joining us, hello. We are the churlmen of the board of the Shade Chamber. We are five 30-year-old boomers who have various degrees of experience and insight in game design, the entertainment industry, fan culture, and whatever else you need to have a somewhat interesting and enlightening discussion about Genshin Impact. We're also very like old and tired, and maybe you want that in your Genshin media. It's here now. We're not sorry. So our show can be enjoyed in two formats. Uh, we have video podcasts on YouTube and Spotify, and then on every other podcast platform, we are available as an audio-only experience. If you're listening to us, we highly encourage you to leave a review. That's really just going to help our podcast, help our visibility, and make sure that we get out there to more people who are kind of wanting a podcast like this. Uh, anything particularly good or funny might be read on the air. I will say, though, I took the time on the video versions of the podcast to teach myself how to edit videos, so there is an incredible amount of shit posts and memes that are only available in the visual format, but that's just an easy YouTube link away. So with season two, we decided it was time to open up a website. We are at shadechamberpodcast.com. That is shadechamberpodcast.com. That's not Shade Chamber. That is a I think a goth lifestyle blog. Anyway, on this website, you can find a directory for all of the podcast platforms that you can listen to us or watch us. It's going to have transcripts and a contact page. So you, the listener, if you aren't on Twitter, you aren't on YouTube, can write into us through our contact form or at mailbox at shadechamberpodcast.com. Again, we're just so happy with the kind of crowd that we've gathered. We've just had such interesting and chill discussions with you guys in the comments and on Twitter at Shade Chamber Pod. This is exactly the gathering of chill, thoughtful Genshin fans that we hoped to accomplish when we started out with this. So thank you guys so much. Thanks for sharing us. Thanks for supporting us. And thanks for pretending that Jer's puns are funny. I've had an amazing time talking to like Chinese Genshin fans who offer so much more cultural insight and a perspective on what, what's happening in Chinese social media, in the Chinese fandom. We even had the chance to talk to a couple people from some of the regions that are culturally represented in Sumeru so that we could try to understand it better. So please, please keep them coming. The more perspectives we have on Genshin from different backgrounds and different positions, the better. We're here to learn just as much as we are to explain and, and shitpost. Yeah, we genuinely love hearing from you guys. And if you really just have anything to add to insightful conversations about this game, what's going on, where they're coming from, it, we love to hear about it. Yeah, we want to make sure that this is all relevant to you and interesting to you. So go ahead, write into us at mailbox at shadechamberpodcast.com or go to shadechamberpodcast.com and use a contact form. Or hit us up on Twitter, at Shade Chamber Pod, on YouTube Community, or in a lovely review on your podcast platform of choice. Thank you so much for joining the Illuminati, and we hope you have a fun ride this season. So we wrapped up Season 1 right before the launch of Version 3.0 and the Sumeru region. We just thought that would be a good time for us to settle back in as fans of the game and not so much as commentators we just wanted to really dive into the story into the region really get a feel for the new experience as a genshin player would we've gone through the main archon quest we've kind of gotten our feet wet in the sumeru region and now we are back here in the shade chamber to talk about things yeah, yeah, and boy, is there a lot to talk about with the dropping of a whole new region. We kind of began our podcast with the uh, early stages of Inazuma, 
and talking about the direction of the game as it moved sort of past its initial regions. Inazuma was such a big step. The fact that Sumeru is an almost an even larger one from a gameplay perspective is just really incredible. Going into Sumeru, my hope was that it would be as good as Inazuma, and it blew Inazuma out of the water. It's starting to feel like the game is really coming together at this point in terms of the direction they're taking, what they want to do, and how they're going to be implementing future mechanics. And, like, we've got new characters and, like, a whole new element to play with, not to mention they've been iterating on, like, stuff they've experimented with in the past. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, should we dive into our initial impressions on Sumeru? Initial impressions on Sumeru was the sealy led intro into this glade welcoming you into the rainforest region of Genshin with an absolutely gorgeous, swelling musical riff signifying the region's Indian and Persian influences. It was a good opening, and I really like, you know, being sort of back on the mainland. We all love Inazuma a lot, but it was nice sort of being in an area that was, you know, connected to the rest of the world map again. We talked a little bit when we were discussing Inazuma about how making the first post-launch region Japan was probably a calculated move because that gives the devs an opportunity to create these completely separated sandboxes separate from both the mainland and each other before they have to commit to a direction to take the wider world in. And that does kind of seem to be the case because you can see a lot of the things that they experimented with in Inazuma were either improved upon or tossed out if they didn't land. And their experience making those islands definitely informed what we got in Sumeru. For one thing, the zip lines are free now, whereas in Inazuma, you had to activate the Electrograna tree to do them. Now they just let you zip line anywhere and it lets you cover it a just massive vistas in a super quick amount of time. It's been kind of one of the most amazing movement techs they've introduced in the game so far. It is so nice to just like be kind of down at the bottom of a big tree, look up and see one of those four leaf clover sigil like hookshot points. After launch, they learned one of the great truths about open world design, which is that everyone hates climbing. And there are very few instances where they really make you schlep up a cliff face as much as they did in Liyue and definitely in Mondstadt. Also, they have something for that now, if you ha do, because there are those little flowers that give you stamina back dotted over some cliff faces, which is really nice, because sometimes you just have to scramble up the damn cliff. And I, I personally prefer not to fall off in the process because I ran out of stamina again. <laughs> it seems like now their philosophy is like, when there is a big cliff, they will only make you climb it once. Then they'll usually have a waypoint at the top. So it's like getting there and unlocking the waypoint is the only like prolonged struggle with climbing that you have to do as you explore Sumeru. That's really interesting. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems like they definitely learned from the kind of pathfinding techniques in, in Azuma, at least in terms of like vertical movement and a lot of horizontal movement. One of the lessons that they still kind of need to understand a little bit better is vertical placement on the world map, which um, was something that we kind of dealt with a little bit in Inazuma, but not as much because the maps were so much smaller. Whereas in Sumeru, there are so many different underground caverns that are still on the world map. That's kind of become the next thing where it's like, well, you fixed moving vertically and horizontally, now fix 3D map representation. Yeah, the, the problems that we had with the chasm map are definitely present in Sumeru, especially when you get to the desert. People who've played Guild Wars 2 would probably know this as the Tangled Depths problem. Because uh, when you have a lot of up and down and stuff is like, overlapping because like you have like a whole jungle, you know, all the nooks and crannies and all that jazz stuff sometimes overlaps. And then you get lost because it, the marker says go here, but you land there and it's like, wait a minute, where is it? Where am I supposed to get there from? Especially yeah. within the desert unlocking teleport waypoints that look like they're in one location, but in actuality, they're on a completely different, um, essentially a map plane, where it's like, oh, I can't access the Daily Commission. 
it's right next to this waypoint because it's not actually next to this waypoint. It's either a mile long waypoint. (laughs) Yeah. As an aside, it's cool that they're adding like the improved movement mechanics in Sumeru and all this other stuff, but it also feels like they haven't done a damn thing to improve the controller button scheme. Like having to, you know, press three buttons and go into Hadouken to get on a zip line. It's kind of weird because I, I do feel like they have improved it, but not on the controller side, just on how you interact with the zip lines. Exactly. And other thing, just like all these arcane button combos when there's still buttons that aren't even really used. You can tell controller is not like a huge priority for them, but like, goddamn, there is so much that could be improved. Please use more buttons. Please let us put more than one goddamn gadget on the gear wheel. I don't know what that is. Why don't they just have a global cooldown and have several items on the gear wheel? It is insane. Shout out to the jelly switching game in the Pokemon Mushroom minigame event for having the absolute worst controller scheme I have ever seen in a puzzle game. I highly implore you to ask anyone who had to play that with a controller. Basically, it's it's a sin. The moment you walk into Sumeru, you're like, okay, yes, this is the plant kingdom. This is the land of Dendro. Everything is bursting with life. You have these giant trees, these giant mushrooms. All of the mobility mechanics that they introduced for this region are plant-based. Like you have the big bouncy mushrooms that you can jump up on to get some air and then shock them to activate them and go even higher. You can use the four-leaf sigils as like hook shots and where you fire like a vine out and it pulls you to them. Like, everything is so carefully thought out with the theme of the region, and it just works so well to give it that that identity, walking right into it. And the sight lines, oh my god. It's just standing on the crest of the first hill, and then you can see you are literally surrounded by these points of interest you can go to. There's the big tree that houses Sumeru City. There's the forest of gigantic bioluminescent mushrooms there's these tall redwood like canopies and then behind that mountain is just the most evil fucking thing you've ever seen in your life it's just a void of souls being sucked into a pyramid (laughs) (laughs) the hell pyramid where do you want to go traveler i remember seeing the varuna contraption for the first time and just being like what the fuck is this and just walking over and trying to figure out if i could like go inside it or figure out anything about it meanwhile like midnight or noon rolls around and water just starts shooting up into the sky (laughs) from it not to mention all the fun new plants to collect Mm -hmm. i would say like half of which don't have seeds which is like please just let me plant them in my teapot so i can have more I could forgive all that if they would let us capture the alligators and the tigers and put them in the teapot. Give me my boys. I am kind of glad that they made, like, meat and poultry so much easier to come by now, though, because, like, man, I was constantly low on that stuff. And now there are just birds in, like, the desert region that just drop, like, a gazillion poultry whenever you kill them. And I'm just like, okay, all right, we're good. Yeah, now we just kill Timmy's birds for enjoyment instead of survival. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, Red, you touched upon a really good point there. Like, Sumeru really stands out as the region where they added so much new wildlife to the game to just kind of further play into the rainforest. And not just regular stuff, either. Like, the mushrooms in the chasm have been, like, kind of fully filled out to the extent where they had, you know, a full event on them. But then they have those weird permutations of them where it's not just mushroom slimes, it's, like, birds. And giant velocal raptor. Yes. Which I know made a lot of people happy. The chicken lived up to the hype. We love mushroom chicken. The jade plumage terror, was it? They didn't do as much like weird biology as I kind of hoped they would, but they got there. They explained that the mushrooms are following a form of mimicry. The jade plume is mimicking a species that have gone extinct. They imply that the real species was some kind of sacred peacock or perhaps even a seamurg or something mythological that isn't here anymore. There is only a mushroom shaped like it. Yeah, yeah. And we have our big old shaggy thumpter beasts, which uh, further betray Mihoyo's dedication to not including horses. (laughs) 
Also, thank you for the far superior and much cuter desert variation of the Sumter Beasts, which look like fat Krogans, and I love them. They're very good. We have Banthas and Dubaks in Genshin now. <laughs> I want to drink the Sumter milk. What color is it? Green, I guess. It's probably green. <laughs> We're in the Dendro land. Yeah. In terms of expectations going into Thumuru, my expectation going into it at the very least was that it was kind of be going to be more austere and highbrow, given that it's like, you know, this place of forbidden knowledge and really like high academics. Whereas I think this is kind of one of the first fictional spaces to really represent it as being like, oh no, it's a university with all the problems and like joys of being a university. Like Sumeru City is just a university town. That's yeah. all it is. Like college is the experience you get going into Sumeru and talking to people. Down to like when people want to get more rowdy, they go down to the port town. It's just a little bit of a ways away. Everyone's sleep schedule is fucked up. Yeah, everyone's always fighting the administration, even as they, like, vie for a place among them. The coffee houses are running rampant with just people guzzling, like, mug after mug while coming up with stupid boat experiments and trying to figure out, you know, what to write on their next thesis. Yeah, and playing Yu-Gi-Oh! while pulling all-nighters, running into the woods to do drugs and then write their thesis. It's, it's just like, yeah, it's a college town. It could have been something stuffy like the Mage Academy in Skyrim or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. when the game came out, it's like, oh, the Wisdom Town. So we're going to go to Raya Lucaria, basically. And that was not what this was. This was honestly a, a really fun memory trip for us. It's like, uh, ah, yeah. yes, I was that over-caffeinated and incompetent at living. <laughs> and, and this probably isn't something that a lot of you experienced in your university life, but I went somewhere that was like a little more remote from like a big city. And so we definitely had like the good bars and the good places to go out for entertainment that were nowhere near the university because we didn't want anything to do with like faculty or people just like finding us. So Port Ormos as like the drinking town that is right next to the university town is just a very real detail that I appreciate. I think it's... A pretty good contrast after Inazuma, which I think that was um, essentially like tonally probably the most fraught part of the setting we've still had to this point in terms of there being a full-blown civil war and people like just being absolutely ravaged by it. So to have Sumeru, which afterwards is just kind of like, oh, it's the fun college town where people are stressing about like homework and playing board games, like. And that one scholar literally just, like, ran away and never came back because someone submitted her paper before she did. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. The NPCs are probably my favorite part of Sumeru. Like, this feels like a tabletop setting more than it ever has. The dialogue of Joe Schmo on the street, it's either, like, super interesting or it's funny. I had a great time just, like, talking to the, the people throughout Sumeru and hearing what they had to say. Honestly, I think what I like about it is that everyone just seems kind of deranged. I think we compared it to, like, the character dialogue in Khan Gao's To the Moon series, where, like, everyone's just really weird, and it just makes it so much fun. I think the, the standout to me, my absolute favorite, was the, uh, the dancer Tarana in Port Ormos. We find out she has been cheated on by a heartless sailor who it is implied to be the serial cheater sailor guy from Liyue. The traveler can tell her, I can teach him a lesson for you. And then she says, I appreciate, but I'll have to pass. I want to do it myself. I'm going to hire an <laughs> Aramite martial arts coach to teach me the most powerful fighting skills. And that was just so funny i really hope that there is this through line that this asshole has these women <laughs> that he's wronged in every nation and then at the end of the game we see them come together and beat his ass that would be yeah amazing. i can't wait for the port in mondstadt as well as another one in fontaine where there are more characters exactly this man is wronged also uh the villages they had a lot of villages just sort of dotting every location now um it's not that the world of Genshin ever felt like it wasn't really lived in, but now I can kind of believe it a little bit more as a place with smaller populations scattered throughout the country. And that even plays into the story eventually, too, with places like Aru Village. Sumeru has, like, 
the most population centers of any region. Like, they have two major cities and, like, a good smattering of villages. It really kind of makes Liu at pale in comparison in terms of being, like, an urban commerce center. Hopefully they'll bulk it out with some additions along the way because Sumeru is just awesome. You, you mentioned the other day that there was a whole, like, trade exchange happening in Sumeru. And it seems like that's going to go somewhere else eventually. I have to believe so. So that kind of, like, yeah, that automatically sort of beats what, like, Leeway's entire concept is in terms of contracts and exchange and everything. Yeah, like, Liyue was Tell and Sumeru is Show, and mm. doing a damn good job of it. Well, and one other thing that I think is really amazing about Sumeru is we finally have other population centers that, like, matter to the story. Like, Aru Village and Vimara Village are hugely integrated into the exploration and storylines in Sumeru. Whereas in Liwei, you pretty much just had Liwei City and then Chinksa Village. Yeah. And like, that was it. Even though we have references to other locations that exist in Liwei that just aren't playable yet. Yeah, and even then, Chinksa Village is most known for its population dwindling because everyone's moving to the city. It's literally just a place where nothing happens. You know, we're not getting like world quests where we're hyper invested in the characters coming out of Chingsa or, or uh what's it the the village on the outskirts of Inazuma yeah yeah it doesn't help that Springvale is essentially like within a walking distance of Mondstadt I itself. literally forgot about Springvale we just had an event <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, that was where the event was based. I totally forgot that. Yeah, yeah. Springvale That's is such a nothing Springvale burger is. of a city. Yeah, Mondstadt is just like gestures vaguely. Mondstadt, it's there. We we got to get off this topic, otherwise yeah. we're yeah, just gonna yeah, go yeah, down the spiral land. <laughs> yeah. There was a really nice onboarding event that happened like right when the region was dropped, where it was essentially asking you to go around and basically get bonuses for doing exploration tasks, like taking pictures of the uh, Rishbolen tigers and the Sumter beasts, along with just sort of interacting with everything else in the world, kind of seeing the different states of how the mushrooms worked and fighting the new big bosses. It was like a big Sumeru welcome party. Inazuma had an equivalent, which was the event where we could get a free Beto. And that was basically to teach you the movement tech and stuff. But like, this had a ton of stuff in it. And it had, I think, a really nice, serviceable story about the kid and his dad, who was a children's book writer. Also references the r and uh, in the event that you haven't started the world quest and can still look at them as just kind of a myth. It almost kind of gives you the context you need for the Archon quest, even if you don't end up playing the R&R world quest first. And you just get those really cute wood carvings of them that you can put in your teapot. They're so cute. They're so stupid looking, but they're so I, cute. I love the little Koroks that they've added. This game is truly Zelda now. They've gone from just ripping off Breath of the Wild to just making a new Breath of the Wild. It's the most Zelda it's ever been. Right down to the, uh, the adding in music to unlock areas. <laughs> Anyway, that event also gave us a free Kale, which for basically everyone was our intro character to the Dendro element. So let's hear some thoughts. Now that we're on the other side of the road to Dendro, was it worth the journey? Dendro is hyper interesting. There's a lot to say about it, but what's interesting the most to me is that it's an element that has so many different variations of elemental reactions. At present, with the four Dendro characters that are available, it's actually more productive to only have one of them per team, which kind of contrasts like the way that other elements have worked before this. You know, double pyro, double electro. It, it was also an incredibly necessary addition to the, I, I guess, meta. It Like, prior to Dendro's introduction to the game, electro was kind of seen as one of the out-like elements. And now with dendro its reactions and that are so strong that most electro characters have shot up to top tier from there yeah yeah my meme kaching is now actually useful like not that she wasn't useful before but like now she's like mega useful <laughs> yeah the memes have become dreams uh kokomi has shot up to top tier which yeah honestly, like... <laughs> which honestly like she should have been before because someone who heals and puts down hydro is amazing but 
now with the with the tech it's she's truly insane I, i'm quite partial to like hyper bloom which is what happens when you have hydro react with dendro and then apply electro to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's good stuff like, honestly like the host of sub reactions is really interesting because like you can you can you have a lot of choices yeah dendro literally changed the game not just for being an incredibly powerful addition and a much needed balancing element but it also literally turned genshin into what is now basically a deck building game your team comp matters more than ever, and weird characters can have weird interactions with each other that cascade into results that we can't even like think about. Now it's all about just testing the limit of what different configurations of people can do. It's really just kind of freshened everything up. I mean, and I think a part of that deck building that we've really seen has been the introduction of characters such as Nilu, which really kind of begin to dictate uh, a little bit more explicitly what your team comp is supposed to be for when you're using this character. I, I think that we're probably going to be seeing a lot more characters with that kind of more stringent support system as we get deeper into Genshin. And that's interesting because that means they're going to also have to anticipate how players use these characters and in what combos. Like, the first stringent support of that vein was Shenha, and she came about just because the lone ice DPS it was so prevalent in meta that it made sense to have a hyper-specialized support character who only supports cryo DPS. And so Nilu is a permutation of that, where she supports these Bloom teams. I'm kind of interested to see if Mihoyo decides to release characters who buff other reactions. I mean, that probably won't be for like a long time yet because like we're this is pretty nascent, but also it <laughs> who knows? I mean, honestly, there's actually already evidence for hyper specified weird status effects because we have, you know, child's whole riptide effect. Oh yeah. And uh Jongli's like petrify. Maybe this is getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves, but that GameStop article mentioned that they didn't plan on having any new reactions, but they can also just sort of make up whatever they feel like as well yeah. in relation to individual characters. And I think Nilu was a good example of that. So Tignari and Kole, them being the first Dendro characters was hyper interesting because they both are kind of the most woodsy type characters you could possibly think of in that both of them are rangers. Um, yeah, they're basically sort of like, forest rangers for... Yeah, the literally government. forest rangers, which it's like... Yeah, there's a necessity for that both in setting, but if you're looking at your D&D classes, that also makes sense. And they also fill very different roles from each other, despite having the same element and weapon type. Like, Tignari is definitely an on-field DPS, whereas Kole is more of the off-field, like, Dendro applicator, especially with her burst. And so they, they manage to fit really nicely, where it's like, okay, do you want to be playing a primary dendro character when you're running around and like killing things or do you want to like keep your old team but like have this new element thrown into the mix so they really gave you that nice choice with those first characters going in yeah i, I would also like to add that dendro traveler is actually pretty pretty okay it's but like there's not a whole lot of choice to go around as far as dendro characters go because it's, right now there's only like four of them including your traveler mm -hmm. but like also uh that that burst is actually pretty decent. I mean, yeah, this is definitely the most useful traveler we've had to date. It's time for a break! But I think the biggest surprise coming out of Sumeru is that the Archon Quest was a cyberpunk story. I believe the yeah. term you coined, Beefy, yeah. was cybertrunk. It was so fun. It was such a caper. Everyone was getting mind jacked in Sumeru today. But I mean, it makes sense that there's so much hacking. I mean, the place is covered in trees. Jesus. I do want to hear a bit from Break, who was the one who cut together the amazing season two Shade Chamber trailer, because we just had such a good time, like, bringing up all of the cyberpunk tropes that we saw in the story. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, pretty much as soon as it turned into anything involving the knowledge capsules, which ultimately just turned into like a USB heist storyline for that first leg of the Archon Quest. That's when the Akasha, all of the Ermensal data, Nahida, 
everything kind of started like really forming what the story was going to be about. And ultimately that was like kind of themes of just information control, censorship, um, third thing. (laughs) Classism. Yeah. Yeah, that was a surprising one. But yeah, we have the forbidden contraband USBs of forbidden knowledge. We have trapping people in the simulation ad nauseum. And we have the thing where that immigrant parents do when they're like, you want to become an artist or like a musician or a dancer or something? What? No, you have to become a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> That's right. We also had Footloose like three times. <laughs> three times. Yeah, yeah. Three <laughs> different yeah. times. Anytime Nilu was around, it was just Footloose. No dancing. Mm, what if I dance though? I'm honestly surprised that her special dish she makes isn't just called the Kevin Bacon at this point. Like, <laughs> Oh, that would have been amazing. <laughs> I kind of also want to like drop a quick mention that like in the Japanese audio, the knowledge capsules were literally called canned knowledge. No, they called it canned knowledge in English too, but they said that was like the street name. <laughs> the street name, Choom. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Canned knowledge is pretty cream as a term. God, everyone's hacking the planet. Everyone's doing DMT in the woods and seeing the face of God. Which God? Who knows? Uh, a little silhouette of a man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is a really interesting take on a cyberpunk story. Because one, the aesthetics are not at all cyberpunk. They trick you. It's still Genshin. It's still the fantasy setting. But it's the nature of the story that's really cyberpunk. It's the content of what the characters are doing, what kind of plans they're putting together, like sort of the heist aspect of it that eventually germinates later in the plot. And it's not really even punk because it's not critical of, you know, corporations. This was, after all, made by a multi-billion dollar corporation. But what it is doing is it is kind of treading close to some pretty dangerous topics for a uh you know chinese based company to be putting into a story like namely censorship and what information is and isn't palpable for the general population to have which i think is the really sort of like resonant part of it it was spicy yeah like you had this group of out of touch old fucks deciding what was good for the morality and productivity of the people and the people were just like They were either not having it, but resigned to it, or just living in complete fucking ignorance. Like Right down to having a disposable ethnic class that is refused entry, because otherwise they would, like, cease to be disposable, and it's more useful to have them be ignorant. Like, if you had told me going into Sumeru that that would be something that they addressed on any level, I would be, you know, very not believing of you, just because that seems very spicy for the position they're in yeah like that was my thoughts the entire time through the story was like this is a chinese company that made this and a lot of this can be turned around on kind of their experiences in their culture and society and it's just amazing that they they made this story and were allowed to put it out into the world and ultimately everything sort of culminates in Kind of a, a, a weird metaphor because it all culminates in everything getting blamed on forbidden knowledge. And then everyone pretty much kind of deciding like, yeah, the Internet was a mistake and then destroying it <laughs> and actually like erasing everything inside of it, which metaphorically, I'm not sure as an American looking into this game. Um, For those of you who don't know. America is Conria backwards. <laughs> God. <laughs> but yeah, um, ultimately, uh, the forbidden knowledge is something in the setting that is indicative of a lot of stuff we've already seen. Um, whatever happened with Orobashi, whatever Conria and Celestia were doing, forbidden knowledge has been a theme throughout the game. So Textually, there's already something in setting that is forbidden knowledge, but in the context of like destroying Ermansol because there was too much bad data, that's that's also pretty spicy. I, I don't know if it's like pro or anti censorship, but it is, and maybe that's reading too deeply into it. Maybe it was just a purely lore thing, but it is interesting and it is thought provoking. So that was a nice takeaway. And credit to Break for calling it almost word for word in our Sumeru speculation episode. 
ISC, they're gonna burn the Library of Alexandria. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. really did have to purge the memes. <laughs> but like, oh my god, just like ethnicity based access of information. They put race in Genshin. That was so unexpected. They put race in Genshin and then only gave us one playable character from that race. Are you telling me Sino's doing desert face? No, I'm That's saying Sino is the is the token desert. Candace. Right, right. He, he's not even from oh, the desert. Candace, that's right. Yeah, it's only Candace, because weirdly enough, Sino doesn't have any direct relationship with the desert currently. You're right. <laughs> we don't know where he's from. He could have been raised in Sumeru City. You're right. Fuck, Candace is the only one keeping it down. They really got to explain Sino. They, they have to say something about him at some point. Him just existing as, like, the academia guy who wears the Anubis hat needs an explanation. <laughs> No, I was cracking up at that line when Rahman is like, Dang, for a city slicker, you really know us desert people. Oh, I didn't expect you to be so wise to our ways. And he was like, you're looking at a little dude literally <laughs> dressed up as Anubis. <laughs> Anubis. But, <laughs> no. but no, he's just our goth furry campus police chief. We don't have to explain anything. They'll explain it when we beat him in a round of Genius Invocation TCG coming soon. Oh my oh god, no. is that what it's oh going to no. be? Are we going to get important character lore from winning matches of Genius in Oh Jesus. Okay. So what I think is also kind of noteworthy about Sumeru is that um, we've once again been introduced to the in-game appearance of Dottore, who kind of functions as one of the more visible, almost side villains to the greater threat of the Moosh, who's kind of made his grand return. As yep. we all actually know, though, the Moosh's entire backstory is all the product of the greater antagonist, our favorite problematic fave, Oriden A, who just keeps being the source of the setting's problems. I cannot think of a single thing that she hasn't fucked up. When you're so depressed that you make an entire person who then has developed problems of his own because you were just so depressed. She thought having a child would fix her problems, and in fact, all it did was spread them around a little more. Yeah, I, I cannot believe more than one nation is suffering directly because of her inaction or irresponsibility. Hey, if you'd just gone to therapy, we could have avoided all this. And people really say that, oh, they don't like how A was redeemed or vindicated in Inazuma. She was never. She reached an understanding and she was remorseful for her past actions. She has never been redeemed from what she's done. She is an absolute disaster. And I love her so much. I need to see what problems she causes in Fontaine. Like, there, this has to continue, please. <laughs> That's the big thing. It's like, in order to be redeemed, what she needs to do is she needs to fundamentally fix something, and she is just so incapable of doing that, that all she can really do in setting is probably cause more problems. She either fucks things up or she does nothing. She's very good at procrastinating. That's why she's Eternity. Maybe the first thing she could do is fucking apologize to Yai. Like, this is something we realize. It's like, pretty please Kitsune Guji. Absolute trash book but it's also just a book where the shogun gives credit to yai for running her country and for doing so much for her and she thanks her and praises her that's yai's wish fulfillment like she wants to be just acknowledged for everything she has done and all the suffering she's been through and a even post quote reform doesn't give her the time of day she is so awful <laughs> And she's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was that was the really interesting thing I think about the entire Archon quest in Sumeru is we are contrasting this awful, awful god whose problems have spilled over into multiple regions with arguably the best god into that, which is Nahita. The first and most likely only good Archon. She's not either a bumfuck or a menace to the planet. She is <laughs> Just trying to do her best. She was really hitting, like, the platonic ideal of what, like, Rogu should be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh my god, baby Archon. Little baby she god. Is the little baby Archon, and she's green. So one thing that's clear is that the Archons 
every archon suffers from a sin that is too much of their own value. For instance, like Venti's, his virtue is freedom. His downfall is so much freedom that he basically shirks any responsibility and just allows his nation to languish. A embodies eternity. The negative of that is that she is a fatal procrastinator and she doesn't operate on the same time scale as her subjects. The Hydro Archon, her thing is justice. It's obviously been exaggerated into this horrible legal nightmare sort of thing. I don't know Zhongli's. He's really well, sus, I mean, though. I think we saw a good example of that in the story, though, where it's like the story in Liyue is him essentially putting his people through what amounts to like domestic terrorism as the result of a contract which he can't tell anyone about and which no one who was involved actually knew about other than him and, like, one other person. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's rigid adherence to his word. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. It's good that you follow through on your promises, but when those promises suddenly affect a lot of other people who did not sign up for said contract or were not a part of any of the negotiations or understanding of it, you're suddenly making your problems everyone else's. He was not a spirit of the law guy he's a letter of the law guy so yeah. nahida's nahida's value is wisdom and her downfall is learned helplessness she gleans what everyone knows and that's how she's accrued her knowledge and because everyone quote knows that she is a useless archon that they should just consider themselves to be a godless nation that is how she's resigned to thinking about herself and it's truly heartbreaking yeah, and learned helplessness vis-a-vis baby cage for 500 years, constantly being compared to the previous Archon. And in spite of Nahida's wealth of knowledge, which she expresses throughout the entire Archon quest every time you're interacting with her, basically has no belief in herself whatsoever and thinks that she's a bad Archon just because of the constant comparisons that are being imposed on her by other people. It's very different from the initial description Dainsleaf gives in that initial story trailer, where the quote was, uh, In the City of Scholars, there is a push for folly, but the God of Wisdom makes no argument against it. When you hear folly and no argument against it, that evokes a very specific image. But kind of like with the rest of Sumeru, sort of taking our expectations and redirecting it into something a lot more humane and understandable. Yeah. And so in Dane's leaf thing becomes so brilliant because he says she makes no argument, which makes you think she's complacent in it. But it turns out it's the case that she's actually just bought into the idea that she has no right to save her people from this folly. Um, yeah, it's definitely the case, which is just another point of both similarity and dissimilarity between Inazuma and Sumeru, where we're both kind of presented with archons who are distant and uh, as successors to someone who they thought was, like, in all regards, their superior. But their reactions to it are essentially, like, the complete opposite from one another. In Nahida's case, it really creates this amazing story of character growth for her over the whole Archon quest. Because by the time you get to that final Archon quest, she's like, I'm going to give the due justice that the academia deserves for what they've done to me for 500 years and my people. And you're just like rooting along the whole way. Like I was clapping along at that moment. Like, girl, get them. Fuck them up, girl. The the conversation where she's like, oh, I now know what anger feels like. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. And and, like, it's it's amazing because, again, this is the first Archon that we've interacted with where we've seen that character growth happen in the course of an Archon quest. Like, Venti, Zhongli, and A are all, like, still very similar to the people they were before their Archon quests. Yeah. Like, they haven't changed that drastically. Whereas we saw Nahida go through this entire growth and arc of her own to become, like, the full Archon of her land. And it was such a good story. We get to see her ascend we get to see her blossom i don't know i have this head canon that like you know, she resembles a child because she's young but it's also because she's stunted like she was not allowed to grow and expand as an archon because she was just so separated from her charge and her people now it's like we finally kind of got her out of the stasis and she can do what she was meant to do and it's like it's so cool also my ignorant knee-jerk response was like oh it's kind of like 
how in things like Hindu mythology, there are divine avatars of greater cosmic forces like Krishna. There are a lot of avatars, like Krishna is one of um, Vishnu. Yeah. And so my surface level reading was like, oh, that's what Kusanali and Ruka Devata are to Ermansul. Ermansul is this huge cosmic pillar of Tevat. And unlike the other gods, they are the still divine, but slightly less cosmically divine incarnations of this mainstay of the universe. I mean, in a way, that is true. Like, we, we did see that with the, the end of the Archon quest and learning about Ruka Devata and, and now Kusanali's role in kind of the rebuilt Ermin soul. Kusanali Nahida, fully assuming Ruka Devata's position, also came with Ruka Devata fully retconning herself out of the setting. As far as people in the Genshin world know, Nahida had just been imprisoned for 500 years, but was always the Dendro Archon and lost her memory, which in a sense is exactly what happened. But there was this other entity that is now gone, and Descenders, people from outside of the world, like the Traveler and three other Descenders who came before the Traveler, are the only ones capable of remembering those beings. Which is horrifying, because it basically means anything in this setting could have been retconned at any time. When Ruka Devata is erased, it's not just the setting and the people themselves that lose their memory of her ever existing. The game UI, the stories in your archive, the item descriptions, everything gets changed. Nahida's story text gets changed. And any mention of a previous Dendro Archon, as well as any mention of her being mistreated by the sages, of her having any less power and authority than she does at the present, are gone. That is horrific. I think that the uh, removing mentions of Ruka Devata is probably as close to a near ending as we're going to get from one of these yeah. games. So if you rewrite something or remove data from Ermin Soul, like it ceases to exist for everyone in Tevat who is not a descender yeah so Zhongli has the line where he calls traveler like the witness to the world or something a has a line where she's like if you remember me i'll live on forever and everything is just kind of pointing to the the traveler is going to end up being perhaps the lone witness of this entire universe my prediction on this or my thought on this is that eventually we're going to get to the point where things in Tevat are going to be so bad that like a universal reset is required and it's going to have to be based on the traveler's knowledge and memories of Tevat and that's what causes a new world to be rewritten and hopefully a more interesting Mondstadt. <laughs> God damn it. You can't do this every time. <laughs> Either that or like it all just pops and we wake up back in Honkai where we're actually from. Oh, yeah. No. That was actually a fake out for me during the Samsara of the Subzerius Festival when you hear the beep and the people talking in the lab and the restart. I thought that was going to be the Honkai universe. I thought that was where they <laughs> tipped the hat. It was actually just the dream meme machine and the sages. Part of me wonders if that's what happened in Conria already, because we still don't know the nature of the catastrophe. And if it's something that can stretch both forwards and back in time, then that might be sufficiently like extreme enough to truly be recognized as like a cataclysm for the setting. Isn't your missing twin also supposed to be also registering as part of the world for some reason? That is what Nahida told us, is that the missing twin of the Traveler is not a Descender, meaning that they are somehow rewritten into the, the fabric of Tevat. If you can unperson somebody by removing them from Ermin's soul, can't you add somebody to the system by adding them to Ermin's soul somehow, which might be really disruptive? <laughs> Which yeah. could kidding. be the source of the cataclysm if something was rewritten as catastrophically as that. Ooh, hack the planet. Hack the fucking planet. <laughs> as a quick connection to the events in Sumeru with the Honkai universe, uh, apparently they enter like alternate realities or like sub dimensions in Honkai as bubbles. They're described in a very similar way to the dream bubbles that were described in the first act of the Archon Quest. Yeah, which is the significance of dreams. For those of you who don't know, the samsara is literally the karmic cycle of rebirth. 
that's what the simulation was supposed to be. It's an analog to you living repeated lives. And the thing is, you break out of it and you leave that when you reach enlightenment, which is literally what happened to the Archon quest. The Traveler was only able to break out when they kind of realized the truth of the reality they were in. But this also implies that this could happen on the real scale of Tevat as well. That, that there is some kind of false play going on that we will eventually gain a truth to break out of. Mm -hmm. So the, the unpersoning of Ruka Devata... We said this is the most Zelda it's ever been. It's also the most near. And also what was near is just how well the gameplay and the storytelling were woven in Sumeru. Like they instead of just making everything like cutscenes and text, they really kind of put them together in a way that they have probably just not been able to do in prior Archon quests. The variety of gameplay methods to tell the story was so much fun. Early on in the Archon quest, when the Traveler is trapped in the Samsara cycle, uh, Nahida is actually introduced to the Traveler off screen because um, by the time the player is made aware of where you are in the Samsara cycle, Traveler and Nahida have already uh, had their introductions and met, and Nahida at this point just sort of becomes your spiritual guide to navigate out of the Samsara cycle. But the way they represent it in the UI is a thought system that is more or less 100% ripped from uh, a Vanillaware game called 13 Sentinels Igus Rim that came out back in 2020, so two years ago, right when the planning for this leg of the Archon Quest might have just been getting off the ground. <laughs> anyway, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim has a very specific system in which characters look over various keywords and clues that they learn about during the storyline and use it to sort of internalize and come to new conclusions, opening up new paths in the game storyline. And this entire mechanic was more or less simulated down to the fact that um, your traveler essentially has voiced lines while thinking through their various thoughts. The UI is almost exactly the same. The camera's a little bit more pushed in, but that's about it. Um, like even the typography that's on the screen with like the kind of hazy blue behind the text and it's kind of like offset. It is, <laughs> it is fucking audacious. Uh, play 13 Sentinels. It's weird and it's cool. What's more is that Aether's English uh, voice actor... Who also played young brother Nier in the Nier remake. Oh my god, yeah. Okay, Zach Aguilar. Who has Zach Aguilar played? Zach Aguilar has played the Traveler. Zach Aguilar has played David Martinez from Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Zach sure. Aguilar has played Keitaro Miura from 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. And Zach Aguilar has played young Nier. <laughs> <laughs> he does a wow. bang up job, too. This plotline's a mashup of all yeah, those things. As soon as we start listing all the things Zach Aguilar was in, I'm like, that's Zach the Aguilar, board. Zach Aguilar. And then I realize there is no Zach Aguilar. The man does not exist. <laughs> 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 Yes, he is a tulpa created by Hoyoverse. Sumeru is the one where, like, after two years of getting shit for being derivative of both Breath of the Wild and Nier, uh, Mihoyo pops their head up, looks around, goes, is everyone gone? Okay, let's have some fun. And then they just wholeheartedly go in on basically every nerdy thing that they like that has come out in the past several years. But it does make that segment, like, super memorable. Then you have other things, like, there are NPCs now that fight alongside you. And so you can actually kind of have these pitched battles with multiple people on both sides, which is something that, you know, they probably could have only dreamed of, technically, uh, when they were doing the Inazuma stretch. You know, that's how we meet, like, Rana and... Yeah, we'll, we'll probably talk more about that when we have an episode yeah. about the, the world quest, but yeah. And as well as uh, Ramon and the other Aramites, like, like the the first encounter with Rana where she starts fighting alongside you is just the biggest what the fuck moment in Genshin up to that point. Then all of these innovations kind of culminate in the final leg of the Archon quest, aka Archons Eleven, where all these people that you've met through the course of your time in Sumeru all gang up together to rescue Nahida, and it's like they do 
different character POVs. Like, I thought that was so cool. The part where yeah. you play as Nilu. I thought that was, like, really affecting. You get text adventure stuff. We even get, like, a fake choose-your-own-telltale-style adventure where you play as Izak, the random kid who's grandpa is a village person we didn't think that Izak would have any payoff because we've played hundreds of quests like Izak's in genshin and they don't have this kind of payoff but then it ended up being like one of the best comedic beats of the entire story but you're out there playing as this kid wearing a shitty nahida disguise as he tries to hide from the core of 30 it's fantastic and everything just really came together in the end. And I think that was the like the most well done plot they've ever had, just because all of these disparate elements. It just felt so triumphant. You and your weird gang of ragtag misfits and IT guys, I guess. <laughs> Cranky IT hacker mans coming together to heist a god. Everyone was either a badass, a goblin, and I guess Nilu. Nilu was kind of the outlier on it. In this world, you're either a goblin, a badass, or Kevin Bacon. <laughs> we'll say they got, I think, a little too much mileage out of that blinking eye iris mask that was in, like, every fucking scene. You know what I'm talking about? It's like no, the, actually. Um, I think the first time they use it was, like, the traveler waking up to Yai, and it's, like, the screen irising in, oh, but there's, oh, like, that, it blinks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, when yes. They yes. did that way too much in the Archon quest. Everyone was blinking. Let's talk about the uh, the perpetuated myth of the silent protagonist traveler. The traveler is now saying more than they ever have while also not being voiced. Yeah, it's kind of a real shame because this quest really highlighted how much they actually want to have Aether and Luin speak. It's kind of a issue that has been present since the initial launch of the game. And now they generally kind of can't walk it back without their being inconsistencies, I guess. I think it's not like an in-universe issue. Like, I don't think we need a character explanation for why Ether and Lumine would suddenly be speaking more. I think it just comes down to their six-week turnaround again. Like, you have multiple languages that these characters are going to need to speak in. You're going to need multiple recordings for each one. And the last several patches have been working on a five-week turnaround, They've only now recently gone back to their six week, but that's still not enough to get them like talking more. Uh, and, and yeah, like it is a logistical feat, right? Like you said, there's four audio languages. There are two travelers. That's eight voice actors that you have to coordinate. I mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's out of their purview, though. And maybe they can kind of like triage like what moments are important enough to be voiced. Is like one thing we've seen in this patch is the traveler has a lot more actual dialogue screens and not just having their responses to what's on the screen but actually kind of leading the conversation now but even then how they apply it is still kind of like it, it's weird because this quest had a lot of audible traveler dialogue but it was super lopsided because the bulk of it was in the 13 sentinels throwback scene in the subzerius festival from the first leg of the archon quest like, that was cool and very obviously a riff on 13 Sentinels, but it's also like, would that recording session have better been spent on other scenes? Like, I definitely think so. I think we definitely needed to hear more from an audible traveler when we're getting, you know, the big world reveals about this character that we're playing and about their role in it. I think it would have been good to at least have some dialogue spoken there that's like even just maybe... Because they'll have super raw lines in the dialogue. Yeah, there was I a lot of really. stuff like that could have been voiced in the uh, balladeer scene. Yes. Um, that that was great. Like that was some of the most engaging dialogue in the whole game, and half of it was silent, which you know sucks. To get really granular, what I would like to see is them speaking more in in engine cutscenes. That's kind of like what the Scaramouche scene was. There was a similar one with Raiden, and in these big like pre-boss conversations where it's not a pre-rendered cutscene yet, but it's still like dialogue. That's where I think I miss it the most. I would like the more impactful ones of those to be voiced. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think we're we're well past the point of believing that this is like a self-insert character now. Like, Ether and Lumine are their Exactly, own yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah, that's the big one. That's they what even I was have their say. own goddamn names, and not just like, this is the canon name of the character. They call you by that name in the game. Also, like, and as subtle as it is, they do have their own distinct personalities, too. Like... You can tell they have different personalities because one of them doesn't know how to wear a shirt. 
One of them can't even dress themselves. <laughs> Azar, Azar uh, or Azar, or as I'm calling him and yeah. his assistant, uh, Evil Neil and Evil Ava. <laughs> yeah, that's two to the moon references. Play to the moon. Hell yeah. It's a good fucking game. Azar was actually like a really affecting uh, antagonist for someone who has a generic NP, well, slightly more than generic NPC model. We initially saw him in the trailers, but um, wow, what a bastard. Also, I got really emotional over Sataria's epilogue in the end where she says, like, I've gotten all I need from the academia. I need to bring this back home. I'm teaching, like, the kids of the desert. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Like, this one had a really, like, satisfactory epilogue. Like, I feel like things really did leave off in a better place. For Inazuma, it kind of felt like things were improving, but not, like, to the degree that it was felt and understood. This is the only place that really feels better than when we left it. Like, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every nation kind of has a time bomb that's going to advance, I think, the next stage of the plot. By the time we revisit it, you know, Inazuma, like, they're still in the ceasefire. The war isn't over. Liyue, it's like, how long can they go without a god uh, before Celestia interferes? Mondstadt is, will Jean die of a uh, stress-induced heart attack before Varka comes back or not? And, like, samira has got, you know, it's got loose ends, obviously, like, Dottore's probably gonna come back, he's got some beef with the Academia, he's got some baggage. Uh, Kale still has her affliction of the, the god's blood that was touched upon in the in the manga and she still alludes to it so just gonna go down but for now like we can kind of be optimistic about this place for the first time in tivat i mean she doesn't have eliazar anymore since they yeah so the limiter on her power has been removed (laughs) yeah like oh god because she said like she has voice lines like i haven't needed to use that power and like i hope i don't or something City destruction race, Albedo on Mondstadt versus Kalei and Sumeru, who's gonna blow up their city first. They're definitely in line for darkness dual elements at some point. Mm-hmm. Kalei is such a good girl. That That is the thing about the, the Dendro women, is they're everyone's daughters now. Yeah, all, all the Dendro guys are gremlins. Uh, all the Dendro girls are not okay and need to be protected at all costs. Speaking of the Dendro boys... Everyone in Sumeru was so hot. Why did they do this? <laughs> like They're, They really wanted to come for your wallet this time. They really opened the gates to Sumeru and went, This one's for you, bisexuals. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, the Aramites. Uh, again, we'll get god. into it with World Quest, but like, Jabrail? Oh my god. Ooh. Oh my god, Jabrail. You did good. <laughs> you did good, Hoyoverse. You knew who your target audience was and you aimed for it. It's weird, though, because like, Al Haytham was the one where I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, he's definitely the one that I want to go for. And then I learned more about him, and I'm like, I kind of hate him now. <laughs> Get this pasty <laughs> piece of shit out of the- we- Okay, I- we will admit, we will concede to break, that Al Haytham is the best jerk in Genesis. Yeah, Al Haytham is super hype every time he shows up, and it's just because every time he shows up, he's saying things like, you know- the algorithms predicted your every move and I'm going to go steal a bunch of USBs, but the vendor doesn't like me and I'm faking you out and stealing shit off of your desk. You know? <laughs> Took all the keys from my home so that my roommate can't get back in. The roommate who he may or may not be <laughs> sleeping with. He's, he's like the opposite of D. Luke because they tell us D. Luke is cool and he's not cool and I hate him. And that's and it. I, Complete stop. Don't <laughs> But here they show us that Al Haytham is cool, and they also don't respect him at all. Yeah, it's like so yeah. it's great. Everyone's reaction to the Vocaloid man is like, oh, that smelly rat person who is such a big rat and can't be trusted. <laughs> yeah, and also yeah, like, like he's the- a stinky little loner who doesn't join in on the discussions. Like, but the thing is, that, like, in spite of all that, him being just competent enough to get things done, um, just goes miles for his character. Especially when it comes to him being incredibly smug to his roommate at the very end. Yeah, like, and then, like, every other character being like, why are you like this? Really put him over for me is fun. Him and Kave have such a fun dynamic. It's incredible. We've, up until this point, 
Like, we've had two incredibly strong women-loving women ships in Ningguang and Beidou and Yai and A, and now we're suddenly given this, like, relationship between Alhatham and Kave that is just, like, the most dumpster fire it's ever been. We're so invested. We're so invested. I was just gonna say, the only other relationship I could think of that I was, like, interested in but was not really explicit before this was Tanari and Sino. Are there any straight people against it? Uh, that strong. one Fatui couple at the bank in at Northland Bank. Yeah. But also that one Fatui couple overlooking the Vista in Inazuma. Yeah. Right. I forget about them because I usually kill them. Yeah. yeah. That's heterophobic. Wander, you can't do that. I can and will continue to do so. <laughs> they have to pay the ultimate price. They have to pay the ultimate price. I just look at the playable roster and I'm like, okay, some of you are by. I don't think any of you are straight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I forgot. Um, they also bait and switched us by introducing us to not one, but two Tepes who didn't actually end up dying in the form of uh, Dunyar Zod and Rana. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I was fully prepared yeah. for heartbreak, and I think they knew it because uh, they were like, Dunyar Zod. Oh, my like, God. She was a dead duck for. I, I was more surprised that she actually, like, pulled through in the end than not. They even showed her ghost. They showed her force ghost. Yeah. She was it's, blue. It's weird how invested I've been in characters without character designs in this Archon quest. Well, characters with less in the character designs or characters based off of template models. But yeah, Characters with a quarter of the polygons. Yeah. But twice the heart. But twice the heart. Mm -hmm. God, Dunyarzad, what a... I love her. What a fucking tour de force she had. And Rana, like, I know some of you haven't, still haven't finished the r, &R quest, so I won't say much more, but, like, her final scenes in the world quest are amazing. I can't wait. And from what I've seen of Jet and Jebrail, I really, really like them. I like that whole party, but we'll talk about that later when we talk about world quests. Yeah, there's a reason we're giving it its own episode. These world quests were so fucking long. They were. So... Please Tremendous. look forward to us covering more about Wander's favorite Dilf. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> Sumeru is the one where I just like, after I finish it, I just sat back and I'm like, how lucky are we that we are gonna be able to have this like absolute like upper echelon of Zelda games coming out every year for the next four years. And all we have to pay is our, you know, our sense of morals. <laughs> you know. We have to pay a lot more than that, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we pay with no small part of ourselves, but goddamn, it is, this is Genshin at its absolute best. And you may have noticed a glaring omission from our discussion, but don't worry. We'll get back to that little silhouette of a man in our next session. We'll see you all next time when we dance a little Fandango. Yeah. Banding, go to the polls. <laughs> <laughs> no! Oh. oh, God! Yep, there it is. That's there it is. <laughs>